It is top of the hour, so we will go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Rachel Paul with IAAP, and this is our third and final webinar in the series that has been highlighting the 2020 Zero Project ICT Educational Innovative Awardees. Before we get started, just a few items to go over. Um, all participant lines have been muted to prevent any background noise or distractions. Closed captioning is available through the Zoom platform. You can select the, the closed captioning icon. And I had just posted in the chat a third party captioning link if you prefer that option. Throughout today's webinar, you're welcome to leave questions in the chat or in the Q&A box. And as time permits, we will get to those. Today's webinar will be recorded and available on a YouTube channel dedicated to this webinar series, and I will be sure to post that in the chat as well, so you can reference that. You can also continue the uh, conversation in the WhatsApp. Uh, there is, was a link posted in the chat if you'd like to join there. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our moderator today, David Baines, to do the introductions and begin today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. It's uh, great to, to speak to you. I can see some familiar names uh, from previous weeks uh, and some new names as well. Um, yes, uh, a lot has happened in a week, and I want to just stress the biggest news of the week, which is that I've had a haircut since we last met. Uh, they've actually opened the hairdressers up here in the UK, and this has been the, the most exciting thing that has happened all week to me. Uh, of course, other than this webinar, um, which we're having today, and I'm really uh, very pleased uh, to be talking to Vasilis from Sci-Fi, uh, and particularly around this issue of uh, open source electronic games uh, for young people who are blind. And we're going to come on to this uh, in just a second or two. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> so very quickly then, uh, just to, for those of you who haven't been on uh, any of the previous uh, sessions, uh, just to introduce you to the team who uh, have been behind everything that we're here today. Uh, Michael uh, Fenbeck from the Essel Foundation and Zero Project and Christopher Lee, uh, the managing director of uh, IAAP, who together put together uh, the concept for the uh, three webinars that we've had this year. Um, and whilst I know that Christopher is certainly on leave, I'm hoping that we may see uh, a little bit of Michael uh, later on. Um, then Ricardo, uh, who's been uh, keeping track of everything that we've been talking about, and will be writing up notes and sharing those later and also is a, a help to me in starting to try and help summarize some of the questions we might be asking based on what uh, you put into the chat window later on. And he'll be doing that in partnership with SEMA from the SL Foundation. Uh, together they'll be making sure that we try and get as many questions from you as possible and that Vasilis has a chance to respond to those. So do use that chat window or the WhatsApp channel uh, to share your questions as we're talking today. And then briefly just to reintroduce Rachel uh, from IAAP, who spoke earlier and again has been one of the uh, driving forces between getting all of the sessions up and running. Um, so the programme for today is very similar to the sessions that we've had before. Uh, we're going to start just by very quickly introducing Vasilis uh, and our first part of the interview. And then he's going to give us a very short demonstration, uh, mostly with uh, screenshots of some of the games that have been developed by Sci-Fi. Uh, and we'll take some questions about those games at that point. We'll then do a deeper dive into some of the issues around those. And throughout that time, what we want to do is to encourage you to post your questions in the chat window and together we will feed those to Vasilis uh, before closing uh, both this and th this is the final uh, webinar in our series. Uh, it's been a, a really quite fascinating program uh, across 
the three weeks that we've been doing this. And I have to admit, I have been really uh, looking forward uh, to this third session. The issue of games, gaming, um, and get the relationship between gaming and education is one which has continued to be of interest to people. Uh, really from when we first saw technology brought to market and market pro products for people with disabilities, particularly in learning opportunities and education, recognize the value of gamification from the very beginning. Uh, and so I was particularly pleased uh, when the third innovation that we did, chose to look at this week really related to this area. For many people, participation in games uh, is a big part of popular culture. And I think that anything that moves us forward in that area uh, is to be valued. Uh, so I want to introduce Bacillus to us. Um, and really, uh, if, Bacillus, do you want to switch your microphone and camera on? And there he is. And Vasilis, yes. you're in Athens. Sorry? You're in Athens today. Yes, I'm in Athens. I'm in Athens. The hot Athens. The hot Athens, yeah, yeah. And um, I was telling a, a friend that I was going to be doing this um, interview uh, with Sci-Fi today. And he was really impressed. He said, oh, aren't they the ones where you can still see uh, Buffy the Vampire Killer? Vampire Slayer? And I said, no, I don't think it's that sci-fi. Uh, yeah. I think it's a different one. So I think it might be useful for you just to tell us a little bit about sci-fi uh, to set the scene. Yes, yes. Thank you, David. I, I'm very, very happy to be here and deeply honoured. Um, well, sci-fi is a Greek technological non-profit company, uh, non-profit organisation. What we do, actually, is that we're bringing technology and research results as solutions to everyday life. Um, we're actually using technology and research results to hack social problems uh, in a human-centered way, uh, using co-creation methods. Um, Sci-fi started as an idea of my brother, George, who's a researcher uh, in, in artificial intelligence, and he saw that, you know, people, uh, researchers reach fantastic conclusions and results, but these do not come into our lives, our everyday lives, as ready to use products and ready to use solutions. And that's why he created Sci-Fi, to bridge this gap uh, between scientific and innovation and society's needs. Um, in a nutshell, this is what Sci-Fi, uh, this is uh, our mission statement. And but we're, we're going to talk on... about the games for the blind, but tell us a little bit, there's a couple of other things that you do as well that might be interesting to people. What, what else does sci-fi do? Oh, we're, like, we're working on a lot of, um, uh, what do you say, let's say pillars of action. The first one is assistive technologies and inclusion. We're building technologies, assistive technologies for people with disabilities, and we are offering them for free. The second thing we do is that we work a lot with artificial intelligence to help organizations get smarter. And we're actually starting to see the cross sections between artificial intelligence and assistive technologies now. Mm. That's something, yes. something we want to start working on. We're, um, we're helping uh, organizations innovate. We're working on e-democracy and we're helping other NGOs uh, civil society uh, by br giving them free technological tools. Uh, and across all these fields, you know, uh, assistive technology, artificial intelligence, democracy and things like that, we have this training and education which works across all sectors regarding and knowledge I, dissemination and skills development. And I, I think this is something we're going to talk about more as we get into the interview. But it's really important, I think, so one of the issues you're picking up here is that Technology for access inclusion is more than just products. If it's going to be implemented, it's going to be successful. There is more to consider than just the products themselves. But having said that, just tell us a little bit about the games for the blind that you've developed. Uh, yes, D D David, uh, as you said, um, 
nowadays people are fascinated and feel awe um, from technological um, advancements. No, <laughs> technology, and we're a technology uh, uh, not-for-profit organization. No, technology is just a tool in people's hands. Mm. Uh, that's what we thought when we started, you know, um, Games for the Blind. The year was 2014. Uh, Greece has been four years in its terrible crisis. Um, and we had this idea to create games for the blind and with the blind. I was, we submitted a proposal. It was successful. It was a go. And then we started researching more, digging more into it, working with the community of the blind. We found out there are no quality games for the blind. Mm. Um, at least not in Greece, not in Greece at all. Um, kids in Greece, uh, blind kids in Greece, they did not have IT or technological skills, but they desperately wanted to play digital games and, and teachers wanted to use them. So we worked with the community to design these games. Uh, I, can, I will not forget uh, in my first um, interviews with a blind child, I, when I asked what kinds of what kind of games do you play? And she said, she, she wouldn't respond, you know? And I said, I repeated my question. She said, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not deaf, I'm blind. <laughs> uh, she couldn't understand very well the question because she had such a limited portfolio, let's say, of games to select from. And this moved us. These stories, there were many stories like this moved us a lot since we started creating the games. And that gap in availability of games, was that your main motivation in creating and distributing these games? Yes, yes, of course. And, um, uh, it, the initial idea, because we had contact with some blind people, um, we understood the, the gap, but we could never imagine how big this was. Mm. This is from the one hand. And from the other hand, we, we tried to find out, um, to use research results to make the games more, you know, accessible and have technology help us. And we used a special sound technology, we'll discuss more on it later, that could help us. So you cannot see a kid who does not have games to play, not electronic games, any kind of games. It's, it's you know, it, it touches your heart. Yeah. And, and we've seen some quite exciting things recently with mainstream console games becoming more accessible. Yes. Uh, and, and hence, I think this whole issue of games is becoming a, a, a much more critical one to an industry. Yes, it's a huge industry, but we're offering them for free as we yes. offer all of our products for free. Um, and you, know, and you offer them as open source, yes? open source as well, and uh, for free to download. Uh, open source licenses is for, for those who do not know. It's, let's say, my aunt's secret recipe for good, uh, you know, I don't know, um, uh, British um, fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's all so, we eat. Yes, every aunt knows um, this recipe and can do it and change it and adapt it to their own. Um, but if you're not a developer, if you're a developer, it's great. If you're not a developer, you just need a game to play and, and some tools to, to create more games. And that's what we did. And, and this is important because it allows uh, code and translations to take place as well. So though you've developed yes. the Greek language, open source means that it's, it's much easier to develop for other languages, yes? Of course, but we did uh, some, uh, some more things. Um, we we allowed people who who do not know how to code to create their own games in their own languages wi without writing a single line of code That's so yes if uh, should i say tell us a few things about um, the games and show some screenshots well, just one know? question for you before we uh i think it'd be great to see uh, some some examples of the games i think uh, being able to see them is a huge help. But how, how many people are using the games, Vasilis? How many downloads have you had? Well, um, I, we have um, 
the downloads for the memory studio of, of memory studio are more than 800 and the, the lead games the first kind of games were around um, it, it's a total of around 30,000 downloads wow that's, that's a we, lot yes I, I must, we are astonished by the response uh, of course it's not only um, we suspect that it's not only uh, blind people who download the games and play them because they are inclusive and they can be used by um, students and teachers who can see as well. Mm. And um, but we are communicating them and reaching out to the blind community. So most of them should be by the blind people, and there are trainers and there are teachers. And of more, more on top of it, we have trained more than three thousand people. Um, sharing the knowledge, uh, talking to um, universities, uh, talking to seminars like this. So the, the numbers are, uh, are big, uh, are big, and we're very humbled by the response. Well, I, I, think, I think you've uh, whet our appetite to actually see a little bit more about these games. Let me, ha let me hand the screen over to you uh, for you to show us a little bit about the games uh, to help people understand what you've done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Over to you, you should be able to screen um, share now. I think, can you all see the, can you all see my screen now? Yeah, I can. Great, great. So, um, we did, we created two things. The first thing is um, four types of educational games with many variations in three languages. We created tic-tac-toe, tennis, and a memory games. That's the first pillar. And the second one is the memory studio. So you can, you're free to create your own game without programming. You just upload pic pictures and sound, and you can create your own inclusive games. So let me uh, go here. Okay, the first game we created was tic-tac-toe. Um, the idea is to, the, our initial idea is to help blind people work on two-dimensional space. We used a special sound called binaural sound uh, from uh, uh, university, uh, in the Ionian University. Binaural sound is pseudo 3D sound, let's say, that um, if you, could not see me and you listen to my voice and we were in an actual room, you would understand where I, were, where I am uh, from where, where my voice, where you hear my voice. So this binaural sound imitates this uh, perception, you know? So you could understand where your sound is. In tic-tac-toe you have X and O's, but uh, we have sounds in the tic-tac-toe for the blind. We found out actually, it was not a simple thing to do. You know, tic-tac-toe is a very simple game. But we found out that sound perception is very subjective. So we had to create five sound sets to accommodate different needs and different perceptions. Then most of the blind children uh, did not know what tic-tac-toe was. So we had to create five tutorials to teach them what this is and uh, guide them through the game. And we added uh, a friend, a voice friend. They could decide if it's a male or female friend who helps them through the game. So this very simple game proved to have many challenges and uh, it proved to be that we were wise to begin from such a game. Then we created tennis, you know, to give, uh, to understand the depth. The, the ball goes far away from you and then comes back to you. You're playing against the computer. Again, we have a tutorial, three positions to catch the ball. There are some awards you can win, you know, silver racket or, you know, golden shoes and things like that. And as you get better, the, the speed increases. And then we created memory game. You are searching for pairs of identical, you know, this memory game, identical um, uh, pictures on a matrix. So we created um, Noah's Ark. 
uh, people are trying to find the, the, the pairs so that you can feed them. There are humorous, uh, uh, fun elements and storyline. Um, the, the narrator asks, do we really need to save the cockroaches? You know, things like that. And the, <laughs> the, the kids love it. Um, so to understand how the user moves from left to right, um, you, you have the x-axis and the tone change for the y-axis, how you move up and down. So this is not binaural sound now, it's a different uh, approach. Of course, we have a tutorial. You can increase the difficulty, have the storyline, and the teachers loved it. And we asked them, would you like us to create a game that you do not only um, try to find pairs of identical pictures, but pairs of corresponding teacher, uh, pictures. For example, UK, London, or France, Paris, for a geography game, and they loved it. So, we started creating games, um, musical games, for, for uh, you can hear the sound of the instrument and the name of the instrument and make a pair or geography games or history games. And then it was such a success that we created Memory Studio, a platform for creating electronic games. You do not have to have, know how to code. You develop your own memory game without program knowledge and it's fun and learning. So we worked with the teachers of the School of the Blind, and the, the children there, assisted by their teacher, started creating their own games. They were excited to do it, they recorded their voice, they built confidence, they had fun, they participated in the development. They, they, that's, this is very important. They, they created their own educational material that is used in the next generation, in the next class, you know? I know that this is all Greek to you, but the first <laughs> picture is um, kids are matching trees to their, to their um, uh, fruits uh, or the, the pets with their favorite um, food and things like that. And then we built on this and we create memory online. You're playing against the computer or another player online. You use a username and password. Um, and this is, this was fantastic because you are not aware if your opponent is blind or not. You know, you can play online with a friend, the game, or with someone you don't know, but you cannot chat with them, you know, for, for safety reasons, they're, they're children, no? And, um, you're not aware if the other side is blind or is not blind. And this for us was, you know, the... The, the, the epitome of the, the inclusion. You don't, you don't focus on ability or disability, you just focus on gaming and playing and having fun. And that, that was the idea. Um, I run through them a lot, <laughs> very fast. There's a huge amount of knowledge behind uh, these games, but I hope I didn't tire you. Well, that, that's amazing. Uh, that's, that's, that's really helpful, Vasilis, um, because I think it gives us a sense of the diversity of the games that you're, you're developing. Uh, and I, I was interested looking at them that although you've developed with um, the needs of blind young people in mind, what struck me was that many of these games could be used and be helpful for a much wider range of needs. Um, especially during this time when people are very socially isolated Shared online gaming experience is, is something which actually helps break down that sense of loneliness. And I just wondered if you had found that there was a wider range. Uh, and Talia has just asked exactly this question. The aging community was stimulating memory games. And I was thinking exactly the same thing. There's other people who I think would really uh, love what you're doing. One of the stories that touches me the most is you know, everybody asked us, uh, how did you help the blind children by creating the games? And I'm responding that the games that the blind children themselves have created have been used 
by people at the early stages of dementia. We took the games and went into a house of people at the early stages of dementia and they played with the games to stimulate their memory. So you are very right. Uh, a aging populations are all populations with uh, cognitive disabilities can use the games. Uh, and let's not forget that uh, we, fo we found out that people with the blindness also have sometimes either cognitive or motor disabilities. So that's why there is um, an increasing difficulty. So uh, most people can accommodate their level to the, uh, the level of the game to their level. Mm. And, and so, can, yes, do you need, to have, now, a, do you yes, need yes. to have a computer to play these or could you play them on a phone or a tablet of some sort? They are now uh, only played on a computer. Right. Uh, it was actually our, our first step because when we started them, um, children at elementary schools in Greece did not have, a, a, have never touched a computer, you know? So mm. um, there are many stories that the teacher used the computer to break the ice and instead of telling them, Let's, let me teach you how to use the computer, it, uh, they said, let's play a game. And this, there are many stories behind it that who, um, children who did not want to walk in, the, in her classroom uh, gladly went in and, and now they're eager to, to have this class. And I thought it was interesting looking at the tennis game um, because many people with a visual impairment do have some sight, even if it's only light perception. So the fact there is a visual cue along with your audio cue actually means that one sense is supporting the other. And I thought that was quite clever that those things are, can be brought together in that way. We're not relying just on hearing. Yes, you're very right. Look, for example, in the screen I am sharing, look, look some, at some things. Um, you can see a, a pair of crowds there, but they're in uh, black and white, you know, so that people who have low vision can see the high contrast and they can use whatever ability they have. And one other thing that came out is this. You can see, instead of cards, you can see a, a, a door knob there. It's kind of a door that you open. It's not a card that you turn. And that came from the first analysis and the discussion we had with the children, because when you flip a card, it does not make a sound. So we discussed with them, and they came with the idea of opening a door in a Noah's Ark. So you, would, you can see what is behind it. So there is so much information, so much rich things you can get by co-creating the games with your mm -hmm. end users. There are things that you would never have guessed. The and subjectivity the of the I wanna, sound. I want to talk a little bit more yes. to you about, because when we talk about innovation, the, the way in which you're using co-creation of working with the end users to co-create, I think is one of the things that you're doing which is quite innovative. But are there other areas where you, you would describe particular innovations, technically or educationally, uh, that, that you're really building upon uh, in, in what you've developed? In, in, the, in the games for the blind, yes, yes. Um... The first thing is co-creation. Co-creation itself leads to innovative practices, you know. Mm. Um, then we had this acoustic interface. Binaural sound, as I described, is a sound, let's say, coming from a specific point in space. It, it feels like it's on the top right corner, for example, or the bottom left corner, things like that. Um, we needed to develop different sound sets to customize the experience. For example, when we played tic-tac-toe, we had to decide, should tic-tac-toe be vertical to the ground when you, hear, when you wear your, your, your uh, headphones or parallel to the ground? And we found mm -hmm. out that some of us understood tic-tac-toe better when it was parallel, but some others understood the game better when it was vertical to the ground. So we had to to provide both options and toning options, things like, like that. Then we had to build different levels for progression to accommodate simultaneous disabilities. 
the use of the keyboard because it's easier for blind, it was easier for blind children to understand how to use the keyboard. Um, some of them were afraid, so we, ha we gave them support from a friendly voice, an ally in the game that would, you know, push them and, and uh, help them, let's go and let's do it, this is great, we are doing great and things like that. The online gaming, as I said, was very, it was fantastic. And of course, the platform that allowed blind children to create, I think they have created more than 30 or 35 games themselves. Wow. So all these innovations, we're not very, very <coughs> clever people, you know, but we're working with the end user, we're asking questions and we're listening to them. And this brings innovation in and then you bring researchers in and the end users in and innovation happens. And that really touches upon something which I think is really interesting, which is we talked about the numbers of people who have used, downloaded and used and played the games. But that's only one measure of impact. I think the qualitative impact on young people is equally important. And yes. have you got some examples of, of the impact on individual children or groups uh, that you found in your work? Of course. I, I already shared some of the stories, but mm. there are tens of stories. Um, what can I say? Um, we have done some, let's see, hold it in. Blind children have created, no, it's not, it's not uh, I think it's around 20, or, no, I think it's around 20 games now. We have done uh, more than six tournaments between blind and non-blind children. Um, these tournaments brought people together, you know. Uh, we even did one of the tournaments, we have done them with elementary schools, with high schools, and with, um, uh, how do you say, below elementary schools, uh, kindergartens, kindergartens. Right. So uh, the teachers said, for example, I, I'm quoting now, I think the benefit was that through the game, we all became the same to different worlds that became one, children who just play. Um, and you know, when I went to a class of, of high school children, when they played, and then as the next group came to play, I took the kids to, to uh, uh, um, another room and ask them, how did you feel? And uh, after some ice breaking questions, I asked them, did you, were you anxious before the games? And there was this guy, this, this, this little kid that said, oh yeah, man, like this. Yes, I was so anxious. Uh, I didn't know how, how to behave, what to say and what not to say. And he said, now I'm no longer anxious. They're just friends. Um, younger children, when they would play online, this is very, it's very, very funny. Before playing online, they went to their teacher. She was a, a, a little girl and said, look, miss, I wore a new dress to play with my new friends. So this ice breaking, this focusing on gaming and on ability, um, this was m more than one more than we dreamt of, you know? The, all this knowledge, all this interaction, even, even um, uh, came uh, down to a research paper being published at, on at British Journal of Education and Technology, but these stories touched our hearts. And I, I love the fact that you talk about a little bit of competition between players. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, whilst all we, we, we you know, we, we, we are passionate about people having opportunity. Um, kids like to win from time to time. Um, and that is unbelievably motivating in all sorts of ways for children. I'm sure you must yes. have found that with the games. Of course, of course. Uh, they, they were, even children who could see, they were not uh, um, giving, you know, space to, to blind children because they are uh, blind. No. They just played the games. And um, there were some times, there was one time that one of the high school girls in one of the tournaments came um, feeling, you know, she had this superiority, you know, um, thing that, you know, let me play with you. But 
I will easily win. And when she started losing, then <laughs> her opponent, you know, <laughs> because her opponent um, gained her respect. And when we blindfolded the children who could see and let them play without being able to, to see, then the respect was much, much greater. So it's a learning experience for us all. And I think that, that social emotional um, aspect, that impact, it's an area, it's a domain which is often undervalued. But I think at the moment, uh, when people are feeling more mental health issues perhaps than ever before, the importance of that social emotional domain is begin we're beginning to understand just how critical that is to motivation, success, and for children moving forwards. Of course, of course. You're so right. Um, the, the, gay, the, the children, for example, love to, to listen to the memory game because they have recorded their own voices and trying to guess who, which of their friends is speaking. So they have this emotional connection that you say. Uh, then they have this mental connection because they are building the the educational materials themselves so they're connecting with the thing they're trying to learn um they're all, all already using another example that i would never have imagined they created a, a game to teach themselves the colors you know i um someone who was born blind does not know that yellow corresponds to sun or uh, I don't know that uh, um, strawberry, uh, red corresponds to strawberry. They had to memorize these things that come together. So they created a game, a memory game, that helps them build these kinds of pairs. I would never have thought of it. They thought of it. Isn't that interesting? One of the questions that we've had from the, from the floor, from Anne, um, actually something we touched upon earlier, but I'd like to pick it up a little bit more. How can people um, do, develop and, and further develop the games to be used in other languages? Um, if uh, you, you, you can go to um, the Memory Studio platform and um, there are two things you can do. You can create your own cards and um, you just upload you know, a picture and a corresponding sound. But then you also need um, the tutorial in another language. So you need to replace these files as well. So everyone who, who, who wants to do it uh, can use the platform and, um, and um, make a version in their own language. Uh, some of the teachers in, we had a story of, of a teacher in Hungary, I think, that could not speak English, could not speak Greek, of course, and could not speak um, Norwegian, that we have some uh, games in Norway, Norway as well. But he told me that uh, I'm using the games before more or less the kids understand what they should do. It's not the ideal scenario, but even in this context, some educators uh, use them. Of course, the best way is to collaborate with, uh, with us and then create a version in uh, another language. And if people want to get access to, uh, to the code, do they contact you or have you got it stored on something like GitHub uh, if they have a developer? What's the best way for people to, to follow that up if they want local versions? We would be happy to collaborate. It is online. They can find it um, and um, uh, the code and the, um, the knowledge, the presentations that will help them uh, create their own games. And of course, we are are open to, to for any questions and collaborations that uh, uh, that can help disseminate in more countries and in more languages. Mm -hmm. Please do feel free to contact us. Well, that, that that's great news. That's great, and I suppose it, it touches upon quite an important issue, really, which is um, you're giving it away. Uh, you're giving away the code. Mm -hmm. How do you fund the project and sustain the amazing work that you're doing? Um, okay, so the first thing is that we, this is a multi-step process, you know, let me see how, yes, it's a step-by-step -step from multiple sources. Uh, there was a fund we got from EA grants, from um, European, and you know, then we had from Lattice Foundation, which is a big foundation in Greece. 
Then we did a crowdfunding campaign in the middle of the crisis. We had the capital controls this period. It was a nightmare, but it, 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 it proved very successful. So we had different streams of income, but what you're trying to do here is to create the game once, and when you create the game and you make it work, this is the first very important step. But sustainability is actually built on, not on the power of money, but on the power of the community. So by working with the educators, with the end users themselves, with the blind children and their teachers, um, you are creating actually people who are eager to continue using the games. You don't have to push the game to them. You, you create what they dreamt of, you know? So now the children create the games, the users teach it every year. They have been accepted by the Greek Ministry of Education as an IT educational tool. Uh, we have mixed tournaments keep on happening between schools. Some companies have, uh, like a company has uh, been involved recently. Uh, and you, of course, we're using this knowledge to create new solutions in other areas. So sustainability is not only financial, yeah. it's based on the power of the community. And knowledge sharing seems to be something that is very dear to your heart in terms of that sustainability. Yes. Um, I always think of this as uh, the you've thrown a stone into the pond, but the ripples go out way beyond. And we've had a question about do you conduct online training can you link to organizations in india um in, in Del new delhi uh, i'm just interested in, how, how do you facilitate that knowledge sharing um to support what i think could be a lot of different people from around the world we have uh, provided a free resources one of the one of the areas that we we, we work on is uh, knowledge dissemination a knowledge does not um, come usually uh, only from us. When you bring players like the ones we discussed together, educators, uh, developers, um, um, accessibility experts, um, all these people have different things to share. And when you bring them together for the first time, not before, not because they were, you know, angry at each other, because nobody had brought them together before, fantastic things happen. So this knowledge starts building up and we are sharing them through our site, through invited talks, uh, mostly here in Greece actually. We have a free educational resources on our site, it's called Sci-Fi Academy. And there, there we have um, um, in, uh, presentation online, we have um, done a couple of uh, um, trainings on accessibility and um, and um, technology and uh, that's different methods but usually uh, outside of Greece I think we have done only three webinars up to now uh, we're not very active uh, but we would like to so so thank you for this fantastic opportunity and I can see from the uh, chat window um, there is an appetite to uh, talk to you much more from different countries across the world um, about how these innovations could be introduced to different communities. But before I let you do that, um, one of the, I, and, and, and a number of people have asked about how to connect to Vasilis, LinkedIn is actually a very good way to connect to Vasilis, I found. Uh, that's where I found you when I, we, were, we were setting this up. And your profile has got lots of links to other things um, that will be helpful to people. Uh, so that's a great uh, starting uh, point for you. But I do, I do want to just, um, something you said, and we have talked about in the past, was really important, which is innovation doesn't happen by itself. You have to nurture and manage innovation. And when you and I have spoken, this aspect of managing in innovation towards a goal to have greatest impact seems to be something which you, you see as very, very important. Can you tell us a little bit about how you manage innovation? 
Yes, yes, of course. Um, as we said in the beginning, we, we are working across a number of fields that are totally diverse. It's one thing working uh, with the disability communities on uh, creating assistive technologies, and a totally another thing to work on artificial intelligence and, I don't know, the news industry and um, e-democracy. We do not know in depth all these areas, you know, but we are, what we are really good at is that we have a methodology to bring scientific results and technology into everyday life problems. So uh, the question is how to achieve uh, impact. What we do, what we found out is this methodology that allows us to do four things that creates viable solutions. The first one is to create a supporting community, to form a community of change makers. The second is to create the free tech, tech tools and offer them for free, to share knowledge and to manage this innovation process. This methodology has worked in, in dozens of projects across very different domains. Um, if I could have, uh, help you with some bullet points on each of these uh, uh, methods, the supporting ecosystem, the supporting community, we, we define them as people and organizations that have the knowledge, that know, can, and are willing to co-create sustainable solutions, and, but solutions that are to be used in the real world. So this community, this coalition of the willing, we, we never uh, include in their first team someone who already thinks about, always thinks about the problems and um, the setbacks and, 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 you know, even if they are a very important partner. No, we want to have these threats that I just described. Of course, you should include need knowers, end users, problem owners, carers. Huh? We should include scientists to, to build on scientific knowledge, to bring in scientific knowledge, developers, of course, to create, to develop the ID solutions, and what we call the multipliers who will help disseminate the solutions. Actually, mm -hmm. usually end users, carers, um, are multipliers because if you build what they want, <laughs> then they are evangelists. They, they share the solutions to friends and their professional networks and so on. So creating the supporting community is the, the cornerstone of success for us. Then, of course, you, we need to develop the technological tools. To, we use um, adaptable methods. We are working with the community. We, we let them describe their dream system. Um, I, I don't know if it helps it for me to share the screen or if it creates a problem for you. No, we can see we can see your screen at the moment. Okay. Great, great. So, um, and you, we create a multi-step development path that each period we build and make a better version of the system. So we adapt, we finalize, we show them to the end users, and of course we use open source licenses. The third thing, as you said, is to disseminate low knowledge because this exchange within the ecosystem is very, very important. Uh, people find out things and, and it's a fantastic process there, but someone needs to orchestrate it. We train the end users to use the system. <coughs> we organize the knowledge sharing process by offering learning resources, by organizing events, by bringing uh, people together. And of course, someone has to manage all this innovation process I described. You need to map the stakeholders and um, find out who to contact first. To carefully select your partners. Uh, we had, uh, we, we, did not, we did not always have successes. Um, I had a very, very bad experience by contacting, you know, some fantastic um, uh, scientists on, on, on mental disabilities, but <coughs> due to politics, uh, we lost, you know, a big proposal because of, <laughs> uh, you have to have willing partners. You need to find resources, to find funding, to test the, cons the concepts, to build a, a, what we call a minimum viable product, something people can play with, test it, and, and suggest new components. 
And then, of course, it's launching the product, promoting, mobilizing a support community, all these things that uh, the innovation, let's say, organization needs to do. It's really interesting the way you're pulling these elements together. Um, we're getting quite a few questions coming through, one of which is people would like a copy of your slides. I know that Rachel <laughs> is going to reach out to you uh, and find a way to um, uh, pry the slides from you to share. But I think from what you've said about your sharing, I don't think that's going to be the biggest challenge that we face. Of course, of course. But looking ahead, one of the questions that is coming up um, from people is um, very much a hope that you would explore ways of making the games work on tablets and phones. I know when I was working, doing some work in uh, parts of Africa and South Asia, we very much found that the, the primary access to the internet and to technology was no longer computers. It was either a tablet or more likely an, an Android mobile phone. Um, I think people would, would love to see if an opportunity emerged for you, uh, the ability to play these games uh, on, on a handset of some sort. Is that something you think would, would be of interest for you in the future? Of course, of course it would be. Um, it, it's a, actually, it's a matter of resources, to be honest. Yeah. Um, we need to find the money and the time to invest in it, because now what we're doing is most of the games some of the technologies we have created for the blind and for people with low vision are actually being transferred in other areas uh, as well in, um, in the aging population, as you said before. Yeah. And we will be using um, computers and we have a lot of resources uh, on this field. Um, we're part of uh, a huge European project uh, called The Shapes. Uh, it includes 36 uh, uh, partners in from 14 countries to transfer these games for the blind and, and other uh, solutions for the blind. Uh, one of them is ICC, it's called I Can See. It's a smartphone application we have for people with low vision that help them um, read um, small texts, such as, I don't know, a business card or a menu on a restaurant mm, uh, I've seen that in menu. real time. So we have created some solutions on, on smartphones and tablets, but we need to find the resources, namely time and money to, to, to create um, uh, solutions on these solutions on uh, smartphones. Have you, have you, I mean, one, another question that's coming up and it's an interesting one because it's one of the most challenging areas. Have you had any success with any of your work in reaching uh, young people who are deaf blind at all? No, we still have not worked with the deaf blind community. It's a big challenge, I know, but we do not have an experience yet. Yeah, that whole area of uh, enhancing with tactile or haptic feedback. Um, I always remember one of the, the, the nicest ones I, I ever saw uh, was um, some games that were developed with Wii controllers where it was a little bit like your tennis but the controller vibrated as the ball got closer to where you needed to swing it so you would feel it beginning to vibrate and then you just needed to swing it at exactly the moment before it started to fade away as if it had gone past you it's a really interesting area uh, and I, I saw that question coming up um, and again, another exciting potential area for the future. But we are coming to the end. I can't believe we've gone through an hour together, Vasilis. What are the most important things for you for the future? Where do you go from here with all of this innovation and work that you're doing? Hmm. That's a very good question. You know, um, uh, if we're talking about Greece, for example, if I close my eyes and reach out my hand and um, try to reach um, for a problem, I would definitely grab a problem on the, on, on uh, working, when we we're working on people with disabilities because um, assistive technologies is very expensive here in Greece and this prohibits many people from uh, in Greece and other countries who struggle financially to have these solutions uh, ready. 
for them. But one step would be to transfer this knowledge and adapt it, not only transfer, but very important is to adapt it to uh, other populations, including aging populations and people with mental um, uh, cognitive uh, disabilities. And, um, and then to create uh, even more solutions for, um, is something we want to do, to transfer the games to tablets and, and um, smartphones uh, when we find the resources. And the third thing <laughs> is to find out how as, uh, artificial intelligence can help people with um, uh, disabilities because I think there, there is a huge, huge potential regarding customization, communication, uh, understanding voice commands, um, you name it. You name it. Um, the, the potential there is huge. And people in the disability community have to understand to, to, you know, to embrace technology as a tool, not as a savior, but as a tool to be used. Well, so that's a, a great way to close our, our interview today. And I just want to say thank you so much for your time uh, and for being so open and honest uh, with all of the work that you've done and sharing that with uh, this global community. I want to th just to close off this program of, of our interviews, uh, just to re uh, return again, just to thank um, all of our speakers that we've had up to this point. Um, Brad Turner from Benetech, uh, Natalie Gonzalez from Fondation Onfe, and now of course Vasilis uh, from Sci-Fi. We really have looked at a huge diversity of innovation, and it's to the credit of the Zero Project uh, and G3ICT that we do have this diversity to talk about and explore. Um, there are so many areas of work, uh, and I truly hope that some of these things that we've discussed, along with the other projects that are seen as innovative from the Zero Project, also have the opportunity to cooperate and collaborate and build even more new and exciting ideas for the future. Just to finish, I just wanna mention two things where I hope that I will see many of you uh, in the future. In September, we hope to see the uh, M Enabling Summit happening virtually um, with a whole range of speakers discussing many of the types of issues that we have here. And whilst the Zero Project Conference nominations have now closed. Um, it would be really exciting to see some of you in Vienna in February, continuing this discussion, continuing this innovation to really see the removal of barriers and the promotion of access and inclusion for all. Um, I look forward to seeing you then. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your questions. Vasilis, once again, my thanks to you. Um, and uh, as I say, hope to see you in the future. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. This is, this is Rachel. Would it be possible to get a copy of your slides? I think you're on mute. You're, so. you're, you're, you're <laughs> muted. Sorry, I forgot to unmute me. Uh, of course, um, I think you already have them. I, I'm, I'm not sure they're fully accessible. I have not checked the, you know, the sequence uh, when someone is blind, the sequence that the screen reader uh, reads it. So I, I might need to, to correct this. 
uh, otherwise it's uh, it's ready I have already sent it to you okay I might have it then um, also I will save the chat I know there was a lot of conversations and you were responding to some people too in case you missed anything I can send the transcript if there's anybody that contact that you want needed to follow up with Great, great. Thank you so much. Because as I was speaking, I lost, you know, I, I couldn't see, uh, read the questions because I didn't know if it would uh, be uh, visible in the screen. So I, I avoided the reading of them. 